All right, so we're back. Last episode finished up discussing about, or finished up discussing the finish to the Hell in a Cell 2021 main event between Lashley and McIntyre. And as I mentioned, just had a couple things left to say before the close off, and that, you know, with this finish, you know, with Drew now no longer being able to challenge for the title with Lashley as champion, I am hopeful. For Drew's non-title booking, you know, this is something that the fans have been wanting since he lost the title is, you know, let's see how he's booked outside the title scene. But as much as I'm hopeful for that, I just want to give this one praise not only to Drew, but to the WWE and that, you know, I am glad that they allowed Drew to be so motivated for this title, you know. When he lost it to Orton at the last Hell in a Cell, and we saw, you know, how determined he was to get it back, and we saw the same thing here, where ever since Lashley beat him for the title, he's been so determined to get it back. And you know, as much as they 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 ran rematches of the two so frequent, I just thought it was such it was such a nice change of pace to see somebody care about the title that much. You know, very different than seeing you know a guy like Kofi who. You know, as much as I love the story that, you know, for 11 years, he'd been with the company and got the title. To see him lose it and then just immediately go to not caring about it. You know, we've seen that so often. Someone loses the title and immediately they're on to other things. It's like Drew was that change where for a year he showed how determined he was to get the title to then defending the title to then getting it back on two occasions. I'm glad that they gave that change of pace. And I'm also hopeful for Lashley's rain going forward hoping for new challengers and something fresh well said jack and to build on that we've seen what you described in the last 10 months with the miz and randy orton they've each held the wwe championship uh, in the last eight months lost it and then seemingly could not be bothered with getting it back they held it for a spell and then became preoccupied with zombies. Both of them. Um, <laughs> um, and then I'd also sort of like, would like to second what you say when it comes to Lashley and MVP. They both sort of like definitely build the title up as something worth having and holding on to. You know, they definitely are living the champion's life, so to speak, um, mm-hmm. in a big way that we haven't seen in a while, right? Like Brock isn't around in suits and living the big life. Uh, seen as another one that doesn't ever sort of like parade around with an entourage, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like a funny breath of fresh air and a callback to champions of old. Drew, Drew similarly is not, you know, wearing bling and, you know, strutting his stuff when he's a champ. So like, I'm really grateful for that presentation and how strong Bobby Lashley is being booked. Yeah, I I feel. And, you know, it's just one of... It, I, I would say that despite what a lot of people want to say, I think the booking so far, you know, obviously, I don't I don't want to say ignoring because it's kind of mean, but, you know, ignoring the filler champs that we had with Orton and Miz, the booking of Drew and Lashley as these WWE champions, while it, it has gotten repetitive of, at certain points, you know, as we saw last year with Drew and you know, right now the beginning part of Lashley's reign. As you mentioned, you know, they've they've done a really good job of, you know, making their reign seem very much different than previous ones and showing just how much that title means for someone. Because the one thing that I picked up on when I was watching this was I was like, a year ago, Lashley was challenging for the WWE title unsuccessfully, you know, at, uh, I think it was Backlash. You know, obviously they reversed it this time, but and now right. with the inclusion of MB, MVP, and you know, with the inclusion of MVP as, and the hurt business, look at how much has changed for Lashley within the year and stuff. And it's something that I hope the WWE themselves pick up on, because before before MVP, much like the shows now, you could kind of say Bobby Lashley was treading water. He wasn't how really funny. Doing much. Uh, and isn't it wild that, that that championship match last year with Bobby Lashley, he was he was cornered by Lana. Lana was in his corner for that match. 
That was only a year ago. And it's funny, Jack, the way you put it. Because you make it seem as though there's a difference between WWE product and MVP product. MVP is WWE product. But you wonder, you know, how much of his involvement with Bobby Lashley is like the company's idea. How much of it was his and going to bat to the old man saying, let me do this and see what we can do with this. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah, and, and it's it, like it's like Daniel Bryan. Like, did that happen organically, or was that somebody's I like, plan all along? Yeah, and you know another thing I'm getting at with the MVP Bobby Lashley pain is, I hope WWE themselves sees just how far having a good manager can take certain mm. wrestlers. Because admittedly, while Bobby Lashley is great. Before, you know, a lot of people knew him as, you know, not really having uh, that that well of, of skills on the mic. Now, admittedly, in this right. one, I, I will admit, he's I can tell he's improved, especially being with MVP. But, you know, we, right. see, we see so many guys where it's like their main struggle is they're struggling to talk. As I talked about mm-hmm. with Dom and how he highlighted, you know, as a non-wrestling fan, he, think, he thinks that's one of the most important things a wrestler should have is uh being able to connect with the fans we see i was i was explaining to him and he was acknowledging how he could see how that's a big problem is if you're having a lot of these wrestlers that are struggling with you know doing the promos getting that connection with the fans you know i hope wwe sees through mvp's connection with bobby lashley how far a manager or having someone in that managerial role for a wrestler can take them i know AEW. Yes. I, I would admit, AEW at times, it's like, it's hit or miss for me because they do it a lot with the managers. Yep. But they at least recognize how far a manager can take someone, you know. And yeah. Out. I definitely think <laughs> AEW does it to a, an extreme where you do it so much, you're bound to have misses. Yeah. Uh, but they definitely see the critical role of a manager. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's definitely what we saw with Lashley because this whole year of Lashley has just been, like, su- such a change for him himself uh, since his return back in 2018. Having mm-hmm. the MVP there to be the man on the mic for him, to do those promos and, you know, kind of take a lot of pressure off of Lashley himself when he has to cut promos. Yeah. I hope I hope they see just how beneficial that is because, you know, you look at a lot of the guys. The, the one thing people will say they're missing that their, their promo ability, that ability to connect. Throw a manager with them, see if it works. I get a sense too. Like I've heard that Vince McMahon or you know the company sours on tag team wrestling, evident by the fact that neither tag team championship was defended last night. Um, but they also have like a real sour sort of feeling towards factions as well. Like, mm. I don't know. There's something about it that works, but that they just refuse to admit or acknowledge and make use of. Because you think managers are great. Wouldn't it be great if a guy like Paul Heyman managed multiple people at once? You yeah. know? I, I'm not going to lie. One of the like biggest fantasy bookings that's always been on my mind as a fan was, you know, seeing how great of a promo and how, like, you know, I guess you could say, like, the prestige that comes with being a Paul Heyman guy, mainly through his work with Brock and now Roman. Mm-hmm. Like, you wonder why they don't create like some type of faction of Paul Heyman guys and girls, you know? Let them manage yeah. a tag team. Let them manage one of the women on the roster and let him, you know, take them far. One thing I think is funny in AEW and regarding the pinnacle is Sean Spears. Mm. Sean Spears is funny. He doesn't quite. And also, you know, if I can be so bold, you can send your hate mail to Jack. <laughs> but I don't get him JF, and I don't think he's all that great. You know? Like, people herald that guy as the next coming of, like, Jim Cornette or, or Nick Bockwinkle or some obnoxious heel. Um, but he hasn't done anything in, like, three years at AEW. You know what I mean? Yeah. He won a, he won a ring once. But, like, so anyway, I bring up the pinnacle. I had to take my pot shots at MJF because I think he's all hype. I think he's uh, overrated. Um, 
But Sean Spears, like, <laughs> you got FTR, you got Wardlow, who at least is giant, right? You got the ringleader MJF, who's apparently the next coming of Jericho or whatever. And then you got Sean Spears. And you got to think, like, you know, a faction's got to have that fall guy. You got to have the guy that's going to get pinned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor Sean Spears. Yeah, and, you know, going back to your thing, it's like, it, it's crazy how, how, like, opposite both companies are at, at a time because it's like it's like the WWE it's like it's almost like they don't care about factions and they most definitely don't care about tag team wrestling and then you have AEW who like you can say tag team wrestling is one of their biggest you know highlights and then it's also on the opposite end of the spectrum because you could argue they have too many factions yes <laughs> absolutely absolutely like uh yeah. The one thing you'll see is people say like uh, they they struggle to like like they struggle with what they want to do with a couple guys so they like throw them all in a faction to like as their solution to yeah like uh, Matt Hardy you know Matt Hardy's being flanked by Private Party and Butcher and the Blade for no reason he just adopted them because Eddie Kingston was busy yeah but you know I, I will say that's definitely one of the the big things that hurt me. When it comes to WWE, it's just that that lack of tag division, especially because, like, I think back, like the one year I always look back on because it it it, it was the biggest like shine of hope for this company going forward was 2016. You know, like I especially think back to like the 2016 SmackDown era, and I'm just like, if you had just made one tag division, it could have been. So great. Like, looking back on 2016, I was like, American Alpha, Anderson and Gallows, the Usos, New Day. They had Heath Slater and Rhino there. They were bringing up uh, the Revival, now FTR, you know. And then think about in the future with hopefully guys coming up, you know, the the War Raiders, the Street Profits, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. even some of the teams they have now. It's like... You could have such a good tag division, but your lack of care for it just, it hurts. And uh, and I would caution you, Jack, I think those glasses have just got the tiniest tinge of rose tint. Uh, because as you reflect on 2016, it's something I think everyone does. I think whatever the form of entertainment we're discussing, it was never better than when you were 15. You know, mm-hmm. for me, I'll start telling you about when things were good and it's probably going to intersect with my sophomore year of high school. Everyone. Hey, you know when music was at its best? You know, when I was in biology, right? Like, it's just funny what when so much hits you at that moment of your life. But um, I think it's funny how you herald these teams that'll go down in history as some of the best, and you threw in Heath Slater and Rhino in there as well. They're a product of the problem <laughs> that they were two guys thrown together. They were the tag team champions, the inaugural SmackDown tag team champions. And you look back at them fondly, but I go, wait a minute, Jack. <laughs> Are they even registered as a tag team? <laughs> Heath Slater and Rhino. Uh, Jack, speaking of fantasy booking, you brought that up earlier. Would you like to hear a couple of fantasy booking scenarios that I came up with during Hell in the Cell and it's more and it's more uh, dull moments? Sure. I got three. And the third one, I'm saving the best for last to rile you up. Ready? So let's pretend like you're watching Hell in the Cell 2021 emanating from the Thunderdome. Here's scenario one. Adam Pierce opens the show with the mic in hand and welcomes everyone to Hell in the Cell. He says that they have a packed night of action ahead, but he's not as excited as he should be. And that's because he's so incredibly bothered with the apparent lack of logic and motivation headed to some of the night's matches. Why are Cesaro and Rollins fighting? What's the deal with Alexa Bliss? He's had enough, and he was inspired by a recent episode of NXT. He saw William Regal at his wit's end, about to call it quits as the authoritative figure after seven years. And before he was allowed to do so, a beacon of light shone on him in the form of Samoa Joe, the Samoan Smith machine, who came and said, I will not replace you. Instead, I will be your defender. Uh, your defender. I'll be your uh, right-hand man, and I'll bring justice and respect 
to the general managerial role. Adam Pierce then proclaims that he wants something similar. He wants somebody to fight for him, alongside him, in the name of logic and reason. And that man who's going to do so is Alistair Black, who comes out uh, to his old music. <laughs> and the smoke and the fog and the creak and the candles. And he promises that if anything doesn't make sense, if anything seems to be waning from logic and reason, they were going to get Black Mass in the face for it. <laughs> Then they start the match. What do you think, Jack? You know, that's just hearing that. It just it just makes me sad thinking about last week. What we were talking about, you know, like how do you release guys like Alistair Black and previously Samoa Joe, but thankfully brought back. You know, yeah. There, there's just a part of you, especially as we mentioned. You know, like and it was a common theme. That's it was the fact that they're treading water. There's so much repetition. How do you how do you release these guys when you need some type of change up? So uh, yeah, that's my plan for Alistair Black. That he's an enforcer. That he black masks anybody who starts to show just the slightest gap in reason or logic. I would have loved Great. to see that. Um, you want to hear the second one? Sure. Okay. Only positive notes, please. Here's the second one. We're later into the night, and Stephanie McMahon appears on the Tron live via satellite. She says that the Raw and SmackDown women's championship scenes are full of unpredictable matchups the like we've never seen. And she's looking forward to the upcoming title defenses between Belair and Bailey and Ripley and Charlotte. Stephanie McMahon references a recent interview in which she promised more than a few surprises lined up for this year's SummerSlam. And she thinks tonight's the perfect night to elaborate on one of them. Just as her father did so many times in the past, Stephanie is preparing to make an ad- announcement that will shake the WWE Universe to its core. Stephanie McMahon officially announces a Queen of the Ring tournament to take place over the next several weeks, and that will conclude at the biggest party of the summer. It will feature 16 competitors, and she affirms that there are 16 Raw and SmackDown female superstars such as Alyssa Sh- uh, Ashton, JoJo, Lacey Evans, Reginald, and the reckoning, just to name a few. The winner of this historical Queen of the Ring tournament will be bestowed a prize equally as historic. The tournament winner will lay claim to the newly created WWE Women's Secondary Championship. That's its name, Jack. It's the Secondary Championship. It's going to say it in gold, Secondary Championship. And will like surely carry the same prestige and authority as the Intercontinental, U.S., and North American titles. Stephanie concludes her announcement by wishing all competitors the best of luck as they compete to determine who will be the undisputed historic Queen of the Ring, dot, 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 not named Stephanie McMahon. See, You you know, (laughs) I don't know if that would work on the main roster, but I was hoping to have seen something similar uh, in NXT when they did that whole finish for the tag titles. Uh-huh. I would have much rather they uh, they include they instead of making tag women's tag titles in NXT, I would have loved to seen them introduce some type of secondary women's title rather than the tag titles. Jack, there's enough titles. We don't need any more titles. I was gonna make a secondary title for both Raw and SmackDown. It got a little cumbersome, but uh, get this, Jack, on the WWE website. On the roster page, if you go to Raw and SmackDown, let me hit you with some facts. There are 14 Raw female superstars listed. That includes Becky Lynch and Stephanie McMahon. (laughs) If you don't count Rhea Ripley, the champion, and if you don't count Lacey Evans, who's pregnant, or JoJo, who's listed as well. JoJo's listed as a superstar. There are nine available competitors. The SmackDown side of things are even bleaker. Stephanie McMahon is listed there as well. <laughs> and then you've got, listen to this, Shara Schreiber, Kayla Braxton, and, uh, and uh, Alice Ashton. They're all, I think, backstage sort of correspondents, right? Mm-hmm. And then you count out um, the, th- the three champions, Bianca Belair, Natalia, and Tamina. 
The last remaining man who couldn't possibly compete in this tournament is Paige, who's listed as a female superstar. Goodness gracious. Leaving four competitors. You can have the most 13. Goodness great. Without, like, returns, you know? Or call-ups. Which or call-ups. You know, I'll get into that after I say this, but... uh. I think ever since the brand split, that's been the one thing that people have called for the most, and that's unifying both uh, the women's and tag division just because of how bleak they are, I guess you could say. Yeah. Especially now more than ever, because as you mentioned, only four other women that are not champions on the SmackDown roster. And like we talked about in the last episode, I get a sense that the really hard part about combining champions or have floating champions is the fact that they're actually on different networks for different broadcasters. Mm. Fox and USA want their own unique champions. Yeah. So, you know, you couldn't have somebody playing both sides of the field, frustrating as that is. Yeah. I got one more scenario for you, Jack. You ready? Sure. Let me hear it. This one's my best one. I think you're going to like this one. So, scenario three. We've had Aleister Black named as the enforcer for Logic, and we've had Stephanie Fan announce a doomed Queen of the Ring where Reginald is a participant. <laughs> <laughs> Through, so, scenario three. Throughout the night, in various parts of the backstage area, a combination of saxophone, trumpet, and groovy bass music can be heard faintly in the distance. Superstars and authority figures largely ignore the music save for a brief pause and glance around the ceiling, looking for its source. As the Raw commentary team begin to set up the main event for McIntyre and Lashley, the omnipresent funky music begins to play in the arena, interrupting the announcers. They begin to acknowledge the music and reference that has been playing all night backstage. The Tron now glows with an array of colorful explosions of music notes, stars, and rainbows. The message appears saying, who's ready to get funky, dot, 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 tonight. Just as the announcers pontificate on what this message is implying, six women come out in a chorus line and dance in unison with giant feather fans. They all congregate in the center of the entrance ramp, making a massive wall with their feather fans, lightly shaking them as the music reaches a crescendo. At once, the spotlight focuses on the center of the stage as the women pull back their feather fans to reveal Funky B, Bronson Reed, (laughs) who has a mic and tells the WWE Universe that Monday Night Raw is about to get funky with Funky B, Bronson Reed. Is this in reference to the reports that him and Cross are having tryout matches on SmackDown and now main event for Raw? Yes! <laughs> I I saw those reports. I've already seen photos. Apparently, uh, Cross on main event is facing Shelton Benjamin and Bronson is going to be facing uh, Drew Gulak on main event as well. Wow! And their tryout matches, but I was like... I was like, don't, don't do this again. Don't, <laughs> don't rob NXT... The last time you did this, the last time you did this, you took away our our uh, our uh, NXT and and uh, North American champion and Keith Lee, and look at what happened. Mm-hmm. I was like, "Don't do this to me." Oh, oh, right. I know exactly the pain that you described. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> when I said I'll get back to the call up thing, that that was what I was gonna talk about. Was they're already like eyeing guys like cross and bronson reed to bring up and i'm just like don't don't do this don't cap their momentum like this like they have their eyes on the right people they have their eyes on the top of those divisions it makes sense and it used to be the thing that after you run with the title boom you're up to the main show right Mm -hmm. they got these guys at the worst time though they've only just started what are we looking at them now for yeah, especially because it's like, I look at each division, and I'm just like, well, okay, I don't understand why you're thinking of calling the champions up. This is much like the thing with Keith Lee last year, where it was like, he was barely starting his reigns, and now you're already capping it off. 
because you but, want him. Yeah, but how faster. often, Jack, when we saw a championship change, did we think, oh, this is a sign of the times that this means Kevin Owens is getting called up. This means, you know, Nakamura is getting the call. That means Balor is on his way. Yeah. They're doing it, though, at the very beginning of their reigns. Yeah, and meanwhile, I'm looking, I'm just like, you have guys who have been there forever, yet never got that treatment, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. Oh, you know, who are, I'm sure, pulling rank. Carrying Cross, I'm sure he's got some big old uh, eyes on the main main event, uh, I mean, the main card scene. Uh, Bronson Reed, I'm sure it could be sweet-talked into it. Gargano and Ciampa, they're smarter than that, though, and they go, we're going to stay here. <laughs> we're going to stay in college forever. I like that analogy, yeah. That, that's basically what the two of them right? did. <laughs> like, um, what was I going to say? Um, and I like, you know what my worry is, save for my incredible narrative, is that they're not bringing them up to fill the main roster slots, you know? Are we going to put Cross up against Lashley? Mm-mm. Cross is going to go up against, who's the U.S. champion? Oh, Sheamus? Is Karen Cross going to answer Sheamus' open challenge, maybe? Hmm. Is Bronson Reed going to challenge Apollo Crews for that Intercontinental title? I don't think not yet. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and the more so issue is that with these calls, because these probably won't even be the only two, I expect mm. the draft coming, they're probably going to try and do more. But mm-hmm. the main issue I have is that they don't take the Bianca Belair route. Like, to me, Bianca, like, everyone always brings up, you know, whenever people talk about how they don't trust NXT guys getting called up, they'll bring up guys like, you know, The Shield when they got called up, The Wyatt Family. Uh, I'm trying to think of other, like, you can label them as successful NXT yeah. call-ups. But mm-hmm. it's like, to me, it's like, that was kind of before NXT started getting a lot of its momentum, you know? Yeah, those like, guys were called up from FCW. Yeah. You know, versus where it's like, look at the call-ups that have happened from like 2015, 16, 17-ish and on. It's like, they've really struggled to do it. And like, my, like the one exception to me is Bianca because it's like when she first got called up, it was a struggle getting her for some reason on Raw. And then we saw, like, months where she wasn't on there. But then they held the draft. She went to SmackDown. And we had this buildup for her that was good enough to get her onto the track of becoming SmackDown Women's Champion after, like, a year of building her up. Whereas... Right. It's like, whenever they do the call-ups, you see them have momentum at first, then they lose it. And then, like, you never see, like, with Bianca, that rise in momentum and them having a clue of what they want to do with them. Like, like as much as I love Bronson Reed, I, I can't fully trust them enough to to properly book them the way NXT has with, you know, his slow build or, you know, with Keith Lee's build from going as new signee to getting over with the fans to then getting that North American title reign to give him a push to the NXT title reign. It was like, you don't really see that a lot with the NXT call-ups. And I'm Jack, not- let, me, let, me just, let me just run a few names by you. Like, Karrion Cross currently the NXT champion. Uh, before him, it was Balor, who had his best run in NXT. Then it was before that, uh, was it Keith Lee before that? Cross. Balor won the Oh Cross and then um, Keith Lee, right? So starting with Keith Lee, who we can say in a year's time, I don't know what happened, but nothing happened. Um, you've got Adam Cole, Johnny Gargano, and Ciampa, who won't leave. You got Alistair Black and Andrade, who did leave. Bad. You got Drew McIntyre, who might be the only uh, uh, clear like success story here because before before him it was Rude Nakamura Samoa Joe and Balor. 
The only one of those men who saw a lot of success was the guy who went back. Then you got Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, Neville, Bo Dallas, Big E, who's still waiting for that breakout moment, and Seth Rollins, who you could say is on the caliber, if not higher, than like Drew McIntyre. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 guys have held that title. Two of them, history will remember. <laughs> yeah, and you know, that, that's my biggest issue is like, a lot of people think I'm calling for these guys to get called up and win a title on their first night. It's like, no, I just want them either to be on TV, like, consistently in a way where, you know, it's not like they're on every show, but like the way right. of AEW does it, where they rotate it enough that guys are consistently on TV, but they're not on it like too much, you know? Right. And, and like, I think, uh, I think a pitfall that we have to acknowledge is that, they thrive in NXT because they're good wrestlers. They're good fighters, and that's all you need. I'm a strong and tough guy who can throw you around in different ways. Where on Raw and SmackDown, that either doesn't cut it or they're not showcased the right way like in NXT. Yeah. The biggest example I can give to you for that is Ricochet. I've always been mm-hmm. one to say that Ricochet is not... I can't even say is good on the mic. You know, he's one of those guys where he just simply can't really talk on the mic. But look at his presentation on NXT versus the main roster. NXT looked at that, said, oh, you can't really talk on the mic. Well, we'll just make sure you don't talk on the mic often. And they were able to get a North American title reign off of Ricochet because of that. They were able to make a North American champion, give him a pretty lengthy reign with it. And they kind of made him like how Mysterio was early in his career where, you know, they let his in-ring work do a lot of the talking and a lot of the building for him. And I, and yeah. I always thought, like, that's how the main roster should have done him, either through, like, the cruiserweight division or through, like, um, him being U.S. champ was just... Having him be that showcase guy where you were more focused on the in-ring work from him rather than, like, uh, him having to talk on the mic or do promo battles with people. Because, as we've seen multiple occasions on the main roster, whenever they've stuck him in promo battles, it's never come out well for the guy. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the North American Championship, here are the names that have won the North American Championship, just so we can reflect on what that did for their career. And I think it's important to acknowledge that when you win a championship like this, it should do something for your career. Your career should not be stagnated. It should propel you. It makes the champion mean more, championship mean more, that was held by these people who went on to do other things, right? It's always frustrating when they reflect on the WWE champions of the, the past, and they always say the same names. It's like Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, Stone Cold. You know what I mean? It's like, well, this is really an animation of who you're not talking to because of, I don't know, backstage things or the fact that you didn't put it on the people that we thought you should have put it on. You missed the mark. Here we go. Adam Cole won't leave. Ricochet. Johnny Gargano won't leave. Velveteen Dream. Swing and a miss. Roderick Strong. Where is he? Keith Lee. Where is he? And... Leon Ruff, you know, an interesting gamble. Haven't seen or heard a lot of the guy. And uh, Damian Priest, you know, admittedly injured. But, yeah, and, and so it remains to be seen. I will be op- op- optimistic about Damian Priest. Yeah. You know, and even, like, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of guys that you, like, there's a there's a ton of guys that you can just say, Given the scenarios, they drop the ball with, and it's like, like, and some of them it's like injury, obviously, like injuries come into like a big play, you know, as you see in like other sports as well, injuries come into play, and that's one thing here, like, as much as people want to complain about Samoa Joe, and like uh, having the WWE dropping the ball with him on the main roster, I'm always one to admit that like, you know, the biggest thing was. Could he have? Could he stay healthy? Especially like 2019 and on, it was like the guy struggled to stay healthy. But there was like 
2017 where you could have given them maybe a short title reign, you know? Yeah. And the other one was 2018 where he was uh, when he was uh, feuding with Styles for like months at a mm-hmm. time. I was like, how do you see that he's staying healthy for months at a time and you're not giving him this title then? He's proving to you throughout these months that he's staying healthy. Nothing's going wrong with it. How do you not give him the title at that point? But, like, other than those two occasions, I always admit, yeah, you know, Joe was injured. So, like, what could they have done? Yeah. Ballard. Yeah, that, that, that program with Styles, um, I think, was a little, a little less likely he was going to win. That seemed like a way of building up Styles, you know, with long-term stories with these really aggressive competitors. He's a little guy. But to take down Joe multiple times establishes him in these WWE fans who maybe don't know about his previous work. But I think Joe should have beat, like, Lesnar. You know what I mean? Yeah. Lesnar could take a beating. He could lose to Joe. Yeah. And he would have lost to Joe if he just paid him enough. <laughs> yeah, like, the one thing people always talk about with that feud back in 2017 is that they made Joe seem like Brock's equal through their promos, through their through the, the brawls they had, even the match itself. And it was like, if there was one point for you to put that belt on Joe, it's 2017 at that pay-per-view. In that five-way, remember that? That, like, five-man, uh, you know, single elimination match? Like, that's what it should have been. Brock wouldn't have even had to take the pin. Pin yeah. Strowman or somebody. Yeah. Goodness. And, like, looking well, back... Well, it could have been. Yeah, and looking back at the... And game, I know it's, like you know it's great... Mm-hmm. I hate to interrupt you, but you know it's great seeing him on NXT on Tuesday, and the fans not having lost a step, but they still like the guy, and they still chant "Joe's gonna kill you," and there's no carrying cross chant to combat that with "Joe's gonna kill you," and it's so good, you know. It's like ah oh, ah, oh, they yeah. know. Yeah, and like thinking back to uh, your other like the the list of NXT champions, you know, it's like it was like. What about Nakamura? You know, how did you not let him beat Jinder at any point? How did you not let him beat Styles at Mania? You know, and going back to my point with MVP and Lashley, if your biggest worry was that he he can't speak English well, a manager's not going to hurt, you know, you can give him a manager and it's not going to hurt his run and his credibility. Uh, other guys, the one that hurt, the, one, of, one of the ones that hurt the most was Having Owens Owens Universal Title reign end at the hands of like fifty something year old Goldberg. Uh, the one that again going back to the injury thing, the one that I uh, I will always defend no matter what people try and say about they dropped the ball with was uh, Zayn, and that's because as much as a fan as I am of Sami Zayn, I am always the one that like defends and says you know as much as I love Zayn. For some reason, 2016 and on, he's had such a struggle to stay uh, healthy. Mm. Like, he, when John Cena had that uh, U.S. title, they did that. They did his like debut to challenge for the U.S. title. He got injured doing his entrance. Then when he got back, there was that good like amount of time. In 2016, he was healthy, and like 2017 a bit. But then there was like. Time, months at a time where he'd go out. And so when he won the Intercontinental title and people played up the whole, oh, in his six years on the main roster or something, like, I forgot like what it was, like five, six years on the main roster, he's finally won a title. I was like, well, that one makes sense because it's like, look at how how many times he's been injured. Yeah, no, agreed. That's real frustrating. And you can't fault the company for not taking a risk on a guy like Zayn if you've got that history. Yeah, and I think the biggest one too that is like the biggest what if one was with Balor, you know, mm. injured on the night that he won that title and then it was like even when he returned the company was still like you got injured on your very like on that very, like not his very first night but you know his very first like big night, you know, winning this inaugural championship. You got injured then it's like I can see why with guys like Balor, as much as like he tried to prove it in the years after that injury that he can be that guy for them, I can still see, you know, that concern to be like, 
How do we know that's not going to happen again? I mean, we saw it in NXT when he got that second run, you know, that match against O'Reilly that took him out for a good amount of time where he couldn't even defend a belt. It was yeah, like, and like how, how frustrating would it be that you rehab like shoulders and, and knees and joints and things and you're like, I'm stronger than I've ever been. And your jaws would put you on this shelf. You're like, dang it, I didn't do any muscle. I didn't do any exercises to strengthen my jaw. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's why, like, I try not to be you know fully negative with the whole NXT yeah, call of but you, you know what? And so, like, the counter argument to all of this is that in mixed martial arts, Injuries happen constantly. Championships are constantly vacated. Interim champions are constantly named. Champion and interim champions are constantly unifying things. And I say the word constantly because if you kind of went with, if you rolled with the punches, you took these injuries as they came, you know, you can address them with this really, you know, easy policy to establish, but I'm sure the fans would get sick of it. You know, it's hard to latch on to anybody. Hard to build that relationship with anybody. Um, in the UFC, and I, and I think it's the case for, like, UFC and mixed martial arts. I think there's a point where, like, we just don't care. It's like, you know, who's the champion now? I don't know. Oh, they're unifying the title again? Okay. Whatever that means. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Overall, though, I, I think, like, the the one thing that we've just highlighted both throughout the pay-per-view and, you know, this discussion is that, you know, there's still hope, you know, we're trying to give them the benefit of the doubt with a lot of things, you know. As weary as I am with NXT call-ups, you know, I still, I still always try and give them the benefit of the doubt and try and be hopeful and support the guys as much as I can when they get called up to the main roster. But I tell you what, Jack, once fans are there and they don't have that excuse anymore, I'm going to be really critical of the product that they're putting out that I'm buying. I'm buying. I don't know, man. I'm too old for this. Yeah. You know, uh, I've pulled that slot machine handle too many times and got burned too many times. You can trot out some Ojo in this need enforcer role, and I'm excited for a moment. But who's challenging cross next? I feel like you're ignoring the big problem. You didn't tell me who's challenging cross next. Yeah. Don't think I didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, and that's my main thing. I'm like, yeah, sure. Fans are gonna be back. You're building SummerSlam as this year's WrestleMania. But what comes after that, you know? Oh, what comes oh, after oh. after uh after the high that people get from fans being back? Because obviously fans being back and having that like the crowd reaction and stuff, it's gonna tell a different narrative, it's gonna tell different stories through it, and it's gonna bring a lot of energy. But once that new effect starts to wear off, you know, like you said, we're going to definitely have to be extra critical because there's no excuses at that point. Mm-mm. Hey, I should finish my third scenario with Funky B, Bronson Reed. I left the sentence out, Jack, didn't you know? But as soon as he's done introducing the world to his new persona, he does a little shimmy, turns 180 degrees. Then immediately gets Black Mass by Alistair Black, who had previously the night been named the Enforcer of Logic and Reason. <laughs> the girls cower in fear as Alistair Black looks down at his work and looks up at the world to exclaim, this is what's happening now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wonderful. And I think we'll end it there with about a minute and 20 to go. We'll close out here. Final thought for the night. Sadly going to end on a negative. My Peacock replay experience was terrible. It crashed on me throughout the entire time I was watching for some reason. Like, it would pause, and I'm like, why is it pausing? And it would go black screen and show the reloading. So, that's the Dustin note Rhodes I on. commented on a fan's Twitter account who had a similar experience to you, Jack, and said, go on to AEW, we'll treat you right. <laughs> well, as we mentioned, we in the future, we may just have to. But, you know, until always, then, until then, thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Rule 34 podcast. I've been Jack, joined by my fellow guests, Mr. Solis. Thank you all for joining us for another episode. And as always, if it exists, we have an opinion on it. Thank you. And we'll see you in the next episode.